Hello. If you were with us for last week's programme, you might remember I said that was it from me for the summer. But, well, it's been a bit of a week, hasn't it? So we are back with two senior figures in Scottish politics and one of the favourites to be the next Prime Minister. Coming up in the next half hour. Boris Johnson is going, but what does it all mean? Has the Scottish independence campaign just lost its most powerful weapon? We'll ask Keith Brown, the deputy leader of the SNP. Labour is preparing for a snap general election and, they say, for government. Fantasy or reality? We'll ask Scottish Labour's deputy leader, Jackie Bailey. And Tom Tugendhat wants to be the next Prime Minister and, he says, save the union. He'll join me to lay out his plan. After all that, Lucy White takes over on the radio right through till midday. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Martin. Yeah, we're going to continue that conversation about who could be the next leader of the Conservatives. And I'll be getting the opinion of one man who was expelled from the party by Boris Johnson, David Cameron's Attorney General, Dominic Grieve. And we'll take a thorough look through the Sunday papers. Great stuff, Lucy. We will speak to you soon. So, big week, big show. Stay with us. Yes, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the programme. I'm Martin Geisler. And you can add your voice to the discussion right throughout the show this morning. Just use the hashtag BBC Sunday Show on social media. Now then, from hero to zero, Boris Johnson's premiership was nothing if not spectacular. He went up like the proverbial rocket and down like the stick. Here, Nicola Sturgeon said there would be a widespread sense of relief that he's gone, but his name was never far from her lips when she was laying out the case for independence. So, has the Yes campaign just lost one of its biggest assets? Just before we came on air, I spoke to Keith Brown, the Justice Secretary and the Deputy Leader of the SNP. Keith Brown, what have you lost in Boris Johnson? An enemy or, to, to borrow that horrendously overused expression, a recruiting sergeant for independence? Well, I don't think anybody in Scotland would understand the point that Boris Johnson was somehow a, a useful uh, person for the SNP. He's been disastrous for Scotland. He's been disastrous for the UK as well. And let's just consider, apart from the cost of living crisis, which people are having to live through, this is a guy that oversaw the UK going to two and a half trillion pounds in debt, the highest tax in 70 years, 70 years, and the highest inflation for 50 years. He's an absolute disaster, and we're very relieved that he's gone. Well, you used his name relentlessly in your campaigning, though, didn't you? So he was a good device for the SNP. He was the Prime Minister of the UK. He was the one that was trying to stand in the way of the express will of the people of Scotland. Of course we used his name. But it doesn't really matter. The principle of independence is founded on two things. One, of course, the international right to self-determination, which all countries, and Boris Johnson said that Ukraine had it and the Falkland Islands had it. And it's also founded in the fact that we want a mandate. The people of Scotland want to have this referendum. And Boris Johnson stood in the way of that. Do you hope you can have better relations with his successor, with another Tory Prime Minister? Well, one of the fundamental tests of that will be whether they're willing to recognise the will of the Scottish people, whether they're now willing to say, of course, they'll have an agreed referendum. Uh, that would be a very good start for whoever takes over. But given the runners and riders that we know about, they're all people that defended Boris Johnson. They're all complicit in the, the lies and the depravity of his administration. So I don't know how it'll hold out a great deal of hope. We'll Not all that. of them. Some of them, pretty, we're going to speak to Tom Tugendhat later in the programme. He was very critical of Boris Johnson, certainly towards the end of his tenure. I mean, do you think you could have better relationships with him? Well, as far as I know, he's shown no willingness to recognise the right of the Scottish people to have the referendum that they voted for. But you're going to have him on this show. I hope you'll ask him that question. And I hope the response to that question will be yes, because it's an unanswerable case that people in Scotland voted for that, and they should have that right. And to get out of this suffocation which Scotland is in, we, of course, were told that Brexit had to happen, even though Scotland voted against it. We're told that we can't have a referendum, even though Scotland voted for it. And we have to get out of this suffocation. And the way the Scottish Parliament is treated, the contempt with which the Scottish Parliament is treated, one of his other uh, runners and riders, of course, has said that she wants to strike down a law in Scotland just because she doesn't like it, even if it's within the right of the Scottish Parliament. Sure, but, but you're saying that, that whoever comes in, if they don't grant a Section 30 order, it's, it's daggers drawn. That's the benchmark for, for cordial relations, is it? Well, there are not cordial relations just now. There are lots of different ways in which it could be improved. And I would hope that anybody that came in would do that. For example, the ready contempt that we now see for the Sewell Convention, the little no 
notice that we get of major pieces of legislation like redrawing the Bill of Rights, which is a retrograde step. So, of course, there are many things which can be improved, but the acid test will be whether they support the democracy of the Scottish people, that what they're asking for, which is the right to vote in a referendum. OK, what, what about Labour? Um, an election is not completely out of the question. They're calling for a, a general election probably between now and the end of the year. Uh, the, the polls suggest they'd have a strong chance of taking power if that happened. It would make a massive difference to the independence debate if they were in Downing Street, wouldn't it? Well, of course, uh, even if everybody in Scotland had voted Labour at the last election, we would have still had Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. Uh, we were the only party, I think Ian Blackford was the only leader to call for a general election, and we stand ready to fight one. We also look, in terms of the polls, to increase our representation. I think the latest poll puts us on 55 out of 59 seats in Scotland. So we will fight that election, but we want to have, first and foremost, the right to the people of Scotland to escape this suffocating uh, union and to express their sure, democratic but, will. But in your campaign, in your mission to achieve that, if Labour were in, if Keir Starmer was in Downing Street, the, the, the fight for independence is all about the, the wavering, the 10%, 15% of people whose votes are still up for grabs. Do you fear that some of them would move towards no if Keir Starmer was in Downing Street rather than a Conservative Prime Minister? Well, that's not what the polls are saying. And you had Anna Sauer on this programme very recently who has said Labour Party now wants a hard Brexit, the same as the Conservatives, even though Scotland voted massively against that. He's also saying he will not cooperate or talk to the SNP. And that includes uh, looking to realise the right of the people of Scotland to have that vote in the referendum. So there's no difference on those two fundamental questions between Labour and the Tories. OK, we've spoken about Labour, we've spoken about uh, the Tories. Let's speak about your party now at Westminster. It's wrestling with its own scandal at the moment, of course. Patrick Grady's uh, victim has said this week, the SNP staff are not safe in Westminster as long as Ian Blackford's in charge because there'll be no meaningful change as to how complaints are handled. Victims basically saying don't matter, they're being ignored. What is going on down there? It all seems completely dysfunctional within your group at Westminster. Well, first of all, I do have uh, great sympathy and I know the First Minister has apologised to the victim in this case and I would want to add my name to that apology as well. But it is the case that Ian Blackford has said that he will look to make changes in relation to how these situations are dealt with. And that's right, that should happen. Nobody is saying, years nobody is saying it was the, the right way to deal with this situation. But it is very important that lessons are learned and improvements are taken forward. Now, I understand that Ian Blackford and his colleagues have committed to doing that, and I hope that will be the case. Are you worried about the way Ian Blackford handled this, and should there be questions over his leadership in Westminster? Uh, well, I think there are some very good people uh, in the Westminster group, Kirsten Oswald and others, who uh, know this stuff, and I think I'm confident that they and Ian Blackford will get this right and will improve those processes. So when, when you're naming people who know their stuff in that group in Westminster, you name Kirsten Oswald, not Ian Blackford. Are you confident? Do you have confidence in him? Do you, th do you have faith in him? And do you think, I mean, the Tories say they'll have a new leader in Westminster when they come back after the summer recess. Should you have a new leader in Westminster? No, too? I do have confidence in Ian Blackford. I mentioned Kirsten Oswald because she has an HR personnel background, and I think that's the kind of expertise that Ian will want to draw on to make sure we make the right changes. Why don't you make her your leader? Well, because uh, Ian Blackford is a leader, and I'm very happy well, that's what I'm Ian asking. Blackford... You're happy for him to continue? Well, I've, said, I've just said I have full confidence in Ian Blackford as leader of the Westminster Group. All right. Keith Brown, many thanks indeed for your time this morning. Thank you. Now, whoever becomes the new Prime Minister, Labour, perhaps unsurprisingly, want a general election. They say they will submit a motion to Parliament on Monday that will kickstart that process. There are a few procedural and practical hurdles in their way, so we might not be voting again this year. But is anyone really able to make any kind of prediction at the moment? The pollsters suggest the Labour Party are gaining popularity. But despite all this chaos, they're not exactly miles ahead. And the days when they weighed their vote here in Scotland seem like a very long time ago, don't they? Well, let's speak now to Scottish Labour's deputy leader, Jackie Bailey. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Anna Sarwar has apparently told you all to prepare for an election. That's never going to happen, really, is it? Well, no, absolutely. And let me say at the, the, the very beginning of this, I think the whole of the UK is relieved that Boris Johnson has gone. But this contest isn't just about replacing one person at the top of the Tory party who then becomes prime minister. That fresh start that people talk about has to be about replacing the Tory government. So we need a general election. Labour is rising in popularity in the polls. Indeed, poll after poll suggests that we would form a majority government. But, but how are you um, going to get it? How are you going to get the chance to do that? Well, as you said, we'll be bringing a motion forward before the UK government um, to insist, the UK Parliament, to insist that there is a general election. But you need 40 Conservatives Tories, to jump ship. If, if all these Tories who are complicit in keeping Boris Johnson 
in power actually believe we need a fresh start, then they will vote to call that general election. Because, you know, people's priorities are not the grudge and grievance that's purported by the SNP and the Tories. They want a government that will focus on their priorities, on the cost of living crisis, because we know that people are struggling with energy bills, they're struggling with the cost of food prices rising. Yeah. On their daily but but, but, it's, but uh, this one is not up to people. This one is up to MPs if there's a vote in the Commons. And the Tories know that they'll probably, many of them, lose their seats if there's an election. So practically, let's just accept it's not going to work, is it? Well, I think we need to try. And, you know, I don't right. accept practically it's not going to work. You know, if you look at the latest allegations round about Boris Johnson, it's clear that we need a fresh start. We okay. need to sweep out the Tories. And therefore, the way to do that is an election. And I look forward to other parties supporting us okay. in the UK Parliament to deliver that. All right. If you get that, let's say you get that election. Let's say Sir Keir Starmer wins and sweeps into Downing Street. He has made it very clear he would say no to another independence referendum. I, I can, I'm sure you can as well. I can hear Nicola Sturgeon with her voice in my head now saying they are just the same as the Tories. They are Tories in a different rosette. And it's a powerful and compelling argument, isn't it, on, on the issue of Scottish independence? Well, you know, if that was the issue that mattered most to people, then, you know, it, it, I'm delighted you have Nicola Sturgeon's it, it, voice. It does seem to be the head. issue that matters most to perhaps half she, of the Scottish electorate. But she is not in the heads of the majority of people in Scotland because they are saying quite clearly, this is not the priority for now. Poll after poll um, suggests that people don't want an independence referendum anytime soon. They want us to focus on the issues that matter to them. And that's principally the cost of living crisis. Do you know, Nicola Sturgeon promised at the Scottish Parliament election that she would focus on recovery of the country. We're sitting here with 700,000 people on NHS waiting lists. We're sitting here with 5,000 more people having died of COVID since that election. And yet we are not concentrating on recovery. We're concentrating on the Constitution. And the Constitution never put bread on the table or addressed these cost of living issues ever. Yeah, but, um, but, it, but it's an issue that dominates everything. It, it takes up all the bandwidth in Scotland at the moment, whether you like it or not. And until it's settled, there's an argument that, that it will continue to do so. Will you, let me tell me this, will your party make it crystal clear over the summer how Scotland has a legal route to independence if it wants one. Will Anna Sauer or Sir Keir Starmer say, this is the process by which Scotland can legally choose its own future? No, because that's not the priority facing the people of Scotland. That's not what the people of Scotland want us to do. And to be frank with you, the Lord Advocate is already saying that the Scottish Parliament don't have the power to do it. I would anticipate the Supreme Court being unlikely um, to say that we can go ahead. So Nicola Sturgeon, in a, a last roll of the dice, is saying that the general election will be that referendum, some de facto referendum. You know, experts in politics have just rubbish that claim and people are going to be voting on so much more they want to get rid of the tories from government they want decency and honesty back in politics keir starmer who i remind you and your viewers um was not charged because he was not guilty of any wrongdoing yeah it's such a contrast to Boris Johnson um, and indeed some of the other Tory contenders um, who really laughed at people during COVID when they had serial parties. Okay. I mean, you couldn't have a more stark contrast. Well, well but, but hang on one time. I mean, you say, you say that, you say that, right? So, so, so here's another issue for you it's in true. Scotland. Sir Keir Starmer said last week, he got very Brexity last week, didn't he? He said, some say we should reverse Brexit. I couldn't disagree more. You can't move a country forward if you focus on the politics of the past. Do you agree with Keir Starmer on Europe? Look, I, I campaigned really hard for us to stay within the European Union. So how do you feel let when you hear that? Out to you, though, let me point out to you, though, that the SNP are latecomers to this. Um, they, in fact, spent more in their Orkney election than they actually did on contesting yeah, this But they're referendum. offering a route back into Europe, but and you're, say, me, you're embracing Boris Johnson's vision of Brexit now. No, no, look, let me, let me just be very clear about this. We know that Brexit has damaged the country, it's damaged Scotland, but we know that tearing Scotland out of the UK will cause infinitely more damage. Now, whether I like it or not, the overwhelming majority of the population in the UK voted to leave Europe. 
we have a responsibility to make sure that the damage that's being done is mitigated. Sure. We need to stop people suffering and businesses suffering okay. as a result of that. But, but let me just put this to you. Keir Starmer has to appeal either to the red wall seats or to Scotland. He can't woo both of those key constituencies back to Labour with the same message, particularly on Brexit. And it seems this week, given that kind of talk, that he's prioritising the north of England over Scotland, does it not? No, I think he's prioritising the whole country and making sure that we stop the damage that's happening to all parts of the UK as a consequence of this. We do need to make it work, whether we like it or not. That's where we currently are. Okay. But the SNP's obsession with independence would cause much worse damage. And I think that's the thing people need to realise. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, I want a government that will act in the interests of all of the people, and that's what Keir Starmer's trying to do. That's not what the SNP will do. All right, well, lots on this to come. That bill goes before Parliament uh, perhaps tomorrow. Jackie Bailey, you will watch with interest, as will we. Thank you very much indeed for your time this Sunday morning. Thank you. So the big question now, and probably for the next couple of months, is who is going to be the next Prime Minister? Well, one of the first to throw a hat into that ring was Tom Tugendhat, a former soldier who fought with special forces in Iraq. And more recently, he was chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. No fan of Boris Johnson towards the end of his tenure. He says he would deliver a fresh start, stand up for the union and beat Labour and the SNP. Well, let's speak to him just now. There he is. Tom Tugendhat, good morning. Thanks very good much morning. for being How with us. Good morning, how are you? Good to be uh, in Glasgow, virtually. Uh, yeah, exactly, virtually. Uh, so listen, in 30 seconds, let's just start with this. In 30 seconds, just tell us who you are and why the Scottish Tories should back you to become their new leader and everyone's new Prime Minister. Well, look, it's, it's great to be with you. And I must say, I'm delighted by the, the support I've already got from the Scottish Tories. And the, the, the Herald has been covering it this morning, which is extremely kind. And the reality is, the reason they're backing me is because they know I am a passionate unionist. The whole of our country, all across our islands, matter to us because this is where I was recruited from. This is where the people I served alongside in combat were recruited from. This is the land that has bred so many brilliant ideas, amazing innovations and given us the opportunity to thrive and to see a better future. So okay. this is the land I am looking to lead and the country that I wish to champion. Yeah, you've said we're the only party who the voters can trust to stand up for the union and Scotland's role in it. What is Scotland's role in the union? Scotland's role in the union is essential. Scotland has supplied more prime ministers, more engineers, more innovators, more bankers, more, I, more companies. Uh, Scotland has been essential to the union from the very beginning. In many ways, this is a Scottish union more than an English union. It's all about the ideas that so many people across these, island, uh, these islands have generated together and the way that they have spread around the world and actually developed the new form of liberty that we've seen spread over the last 70, 80 years. These are in many ways Scottish ideas, the principles of human rights that came out of that wonderful Edinburgh lawyer, Maxwell Fife. You know, the principles of uh, free trade that came out of, of course, yeah. Adam Smith. You know, these are fantastic exports of Scotland through the Union as part of Great Britain, as part of the United okay. Kingdom, to the whole world. You say it's a, it's a Scottish Union perhaps more than it's an English Union. Is it a voluntary union? Of course it's a voluntary union. So why, so why can't one member decide it, it wants to walk away from the club? There's no rule and nobody's saying that that can't happen. But the only, your party is saying that no, can't happen specifically. That's not, no, that's not true. What we're saying simply is that you can't keep asking the same question, hoping for a different answer. What this well, is all do, about... On, well, sorry, Mr. Tugner. Let me, let me, let me, let me, no, 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 no. Please let me stop you right there. You're saying it can happen. How can it happen? What is the legal pathway for Scotland to walk away from the union? You know the legal pathway. It's section 30 orders and all the Which rest. You, you know grant. that. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. You know, you know all of that. You know all of that. You don't need me to take you through the legals. What you're actually arguing is you're arguing that the polls aren't pointing in the direction that the SNP wish and actually they're failing in education and they're failing in healthcare and now they're trying to distract by talking about separation again. I'm afraid this is a cheap political play. What we really need to be talking about is the success of Scottish uh, students and the success of Scottish doctors and nurses and the ability to help them to do even better. What we need to do is to make people succeed, not tear them apart. And I think that's exactly what the Conservative Party, what Scottish Conservatives and I as the leader of the Conservative Party in Westminster would be doing because what we're talking about here is the success of the entire United Kingdom, the whole community, and bringing together and bringing out what makes us so much stronger, the National Health Service, the British Army that I was so lucky to serve in, and all those wonderful, wonderful people, right. ideas and uh, economic ties that make us better and stronger. 
Let me ask you this. If you, you, you want to become the next Prime Minister, the, the bookmakers suggest you're, you're one of the, the favourite candidates. If you were, under what circumstances would you be prepared to grant Scotland a, th a Section 30 order, a referendum? Look, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals in the future. What I'm interested in is delivering now. What, I'm really care what I really care about well, this is This is a the really important Scotland question. If you want to bring people on side and impress people who might not naturally be drawn to you in Scotland, you have to address that issue. What, under what circumstances I think would you I, grant a referendum? Uh, you'll forgive me. I think what I really need to address is what people care about now. There's more month at the end of the, at the, end of the pay packet than there should be. We're seeing an economic uh, difficulty that we're all struggling with, whether you're in Glasgow or in Canterbury. We're all feeling the fact that it's now £2 a litre for, for petrol. I don't know about you, but I notice it. We're all feeling the fact that gas prices are rising and you're going to feel it more sadly in Scotland than you are in, in communities like Kent because it gets colder earlier. You know, the reality is these are the issues we need to be dealing so, with. So is, we, we is need your to be party going to address passionate that? About. Of course, we need to be absolutely passionate about addressing the long-term economic strategy that we need for this country. We need a 10-year economic plan for growth. And that's what I'm going to be setting out because we need an economy that is more resilient, that is fairer, and of course that is stronger. We need to make sure that this 10-year economic plan delivers across the whole of the United Kingdom, oh, delivers for okay. every community, Let and make sure we support businesses and families. Let me pick up on that one example that you gave us in sure. there. W would you, as Prime Minister, increase the money that comes here to perhaps make allowance for the fact that it gets colder in, hi in the highlands than it does in the southeast? Look, I've already spoken about lowering fuel tax, which is an incredibly important thing to do for our entire economy, because as you rightly say... It doesn't it reflect that, so that imbalance that Sorry. you just brought up. But it, but it does, of course it does, because the more fuel you use, the higher tax you pay. So that's exactly what it does. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we look at how we make this economy grow, how we support families across the whole of the United Kingdom, how we treat everybody fairly and equally and make the economy stronger. That's what a 10-year economic plan is all about. R that's Rishi why we Sunak need a clean says cutting start. taxes is a fairy tale. Well, we need a clean start, frankly, because we can't keep going over the old arguments. What we need to be doing is we need to be talking about returning the government to the service of the British people, returning the Conservative Party to the service of the British people and championing those fantastic Conservative voices that we have across the United Kingdom and particularly in Scotland. You know, we have some fantastic Conservative representatives okay. across the communities and I would love to see their voices championed, their policies delivered and through that a much stronger, much fairer, much more resilient British economy. Let me talk to you about one of those Conservative voices, the voice, uh, arguably, that is the, the kind of the tip of the spear of the Conservative Party up here, Alistair Jack, the Scottish Secretary. We've, we've been on air, and this is not just a self-indulgent question, I'm getting to a point. This programme has been on air for 18 months now. We are, uh, I would like to think, the kind of the big political discussion programme in I'm Scotland. Here. Uh, quite. We ask for him to come on here repeatedly. He's been, on, he's been on here twice in 18 months. We might not ask for him to invite him every week, but we, we invite him routinely. We've had him twice. We've had two Scotland office ministers once each in 18 months. And this is the UK government trying to project itself in Scotland. Is that good enough? Well, look, I have been uh, an MP for Kent now for seven years, and I've been chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, answering for the whole of Parliament on foreign affairs for the last five. And I've been on your show, I've been on other shows in Scotland on a pretty frequent basis. No, because no, no, I think sure, but the, the Scottish Secretary is being empty chaired by me week in, week out. We invited I, him on, he wasn't available. Is that good all, enough? Let, let, actually, could, let, let me ask you, let me, sorry, let me broaden this question out. He is Boris Johnson's right hand man, limpet like in Downing Street before that resignation speech and in Downing Street beside him after. After that resignation speech, if you were Prime Minister, would you keep Alistair Jack on? Look, Douglas is the elected leader of the Scottish Conservatives and Douglas speaks for us in Holyrood and does, I think, a really good job of championing not just Scottish issues in Holyrood, but uni the issues of the United Kingdom in Holyrood. He's a great British politician. He's a fantastic leader for Scotland. And I, I must say, I am absolutely delighted to be working with many, many Scottish Parliament parliamentarians in the Scottish Parliament and in the UK Parliament and, and to have voices like his around. I think they're really, really important. OK, the fight begins now. There, this, this has been a, a, an absolute circus over the last few days. Uh, Parliament resumes tomorrow. The business of governing the country resumes tomorrow, but actually it's going to be overshadowed by the, the fight for the leadership. How venal, how dirty is this fight going to become? Because we're hearing already suggestions that candidates are briefing against other candidates, even handing dossiers about other candidates to the Labour Party with all sorts of grubby allegations on them. This is going to become really very unseemly, isn't it? 
Well, I, I really hope not, because that would be really uh, extremely destructive behaviour, not just uh, for individuals, but for the party and for the country. The reality is we need to get beyond the divisions that have dominated our lives. You know, we've seen those divisions uh, propped up by the SNP in Scotland, propped up by others in the rest of the United Kingdom. We need to get beyond that. We need a clean start. We need to return the government, not to those old arguments, but return it to the service of the British people and return the Conservative Party to serving the interests and delivering for the British people across all our islands. That's an answer I suspect you had up your sleeve before you came on. How dirty is the fight going to get is what I want to know. I don't know because I'm not going to be doing any of that and I hope very much that nobody else will. Is so it not useful in a way that actually we, if there is dirt on people we find out about them before, before they come into office? Well it's certainly the journalist's job to ask questions and that's <laughs> exactly what you're doing to me uh, and I'm very very happy to answer them and I'm very happy to answer questions from uh, from people who have who have who have them I mean that's you know I think it's perfectly legitimate to hold politicians to account it's essential and the job of journalism is one of the pillars of democracy so I'm absolutely uh, passionate about that but we really do need a clean start and, and and we don't get a clean start by just raking over all grounds between between ourselves we get a clean start by having a fresh face a fresh leadership new ideas a 10-year economic plan that delivers for growth and then a return to service, a government that works for the British people across these islands, and of course, a return to service by the Conservative I'd Party. I, I think I detected an almost weary sigh there already, Tom <laughs> Tugana. If it, if it Not was, a bit of it. you better get ready. Not a bit of it. No, no, I'm very, be... very, I'm full of, full, of, full of energy for this. We need to serve, and I'm ready to lead this country. All right, well, listen, we're going to hear a lot more from you and see a lot more of you, I'm sure, over the weeks ahead. Uh, thanks very much indeed for being, us, being with us on the Sunday show this morning. Thank you. It's nice to be with you. Tom Tugendhat there. Well, as discussed, last week was chaotic enough, but the week ahead has the potential to deliver yet more drama and intrigue, as we've just been hearing. Well, let's get an idea of what's to come and when with our political correspondent, Lindsay Buse. Hi, Lindsay. It is yeah. going to get pretty manky, isn't it, all of this, inevitably? What's going to happen and when? Yeah, I think so, Martin. I mean... You know, the drama is not going to stop, let's put it that way. Already talk in the papers today about dirty dossiers being passed around, uh, the candidates arguing with each other over policy, but also, you know, perhaps a bit worried that some skeletons in their closets might be brought out by their rivals as well. So we do have a raft of candidates who've already declared their intention to run. We might get some more officially declaring uh, today and into tomorrow. Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, is one who is expected to run but hasn't officially declared her intention to do that yet. Uh, on Monday, the 1922 committee, that's the committee of Tory backbenchers, will be drawing up the rules for the contest. It's a two-stage process. The first stage is the shortlisting of candidates and possible that they might try to try and streamline that to make that first stage of shortlisting happen a bit quicker. They really want to get this contest moving and get it over and done with as quickly as possible. So they're hoping to try and get through that first stage by July 21st when Westminster goes into recess. So more on the process from tomorrow and I think we'll hear a lot more from the candidates who've already declared and more who will be declaring Labour as well going for perhaps that, that vote of uh, no confidence in the Prime Minister in Parliament too. Yeah and very very briefly in a sentence if you can uh, maybe a new Prime Minister by the time Parliament comes back in September? Yeah, that is the aim. The second stage goes to the Tory membership to vote between a final two candidates that make it to the end of that first stage, expecting the result early September when Parliament returns. Were you hoping for a quiet summer? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. All right, <laughs> Lindsay Views, many thanks indeed. Right, that is all we have time for today. And once again, I'm going to say we're taking a break from the telly for the summer. I probably won't be here next week, but who knows? We are, though, going to be on the radio, as ever, of course, from 10 every Sunday. If you're watching on the television, bye for now. If you're with us on the radio, here's Lucy. Where were you for that first stolen kiss?